Okay, hello everybody. Once again, it's David Fisher from Immigration Chambers here in Auckland, New Zealand, and we invite today a special guest, Mr. Ed Remington from Australia. How are you going, Ed? I'm doing great. Uh, yourself? Yeah, not too bad, not too bad. It's a day off here in New Zealand. It's Monday after Anzac Day, so this is what we call Mondayization of holidays, and I believe that some states in Australia do the same. Is that yeah, right? That, that's correct. So um, here in Victoria, it's not a public holiday, but uh, in other states, like uh, I think uh, uh, Western Australia at the moment, I think ACT, they have a public holiday. So yeah, it's a, a state by state basis. State by state. Okay. Well, anyway, we thought we'd do this this um, this video here for our audience um, to celebrate Anzac Day, but also to have a chat about the. Um, the recently announced and recently implemented travel bubble between Australia and New Zealand. And obviously, as, um, as we all know, we're going through a COVID pandemic and, and slowly now countries are, are some, some countries are having a difficult time with the virus and some less than others. Australia and New Zealand have decided to open up a, a two way travel bubble so that we can travel from the 19th of April. And so that's been going for a week now. And from all accounts, it's been going well. Um, have you noticed an increase of New Zealanders in, in uh, Melbourne, Ed? Uh, <laughs> I, well, that, well, I can't say uh, personally, but it doesn't feel like that there has been an increase. But uh, I know that the airport's a lot busier um, here in Melbourne. There are a lot more people um, using the airport, which is good for those businesses that are um, situated in the airport. Uh, um, so I think that uh, this travel bubble is a good uh, step towards like the COVID normal where we're sort of traveling, but we're also, um, uh, you know, stimulating each other economy yeah sure no I, we, we definitely know um, some of the businesses here in New Zealand are very thankful to have tourism coming in from Australia but specifically if we can get right straight to the crux of the matter in regards to our industry of immigration um, let's talk about what that really means because um, I saw an article in the news over the weekend about an Australian man who was using the travel bubble to go to Russia and it made me have a think about it and i realized well i, I remembered because it's something I'd, I'd heard about before but over in australia um during this entire pandemic if you want to leave the country you need to actually formally request an exemption to travel just to leave the country is that correct yes that, that's correct uh for those who don't know that I actually had to get a travel exemption last year. I, um, uh, a lot of my business is in South Korea and I uh, went to South Korea in June last year and I had to even apply for my own travel exemption to leave. And actually uh, I got uh, knocked back three times before getting a travel exemption. Okay, and so what are the reasons that you can claim the exemption for? Uh, there's not many reasons. Uh, you, a lot of it is like compelling, compassionate reasons. So, for example, that you've got a family member that's sick or uh, someone that is uh, passed away overseas, then uh, you can uh, try to get a travel exemption based on that. Um, uh, it was a really, really strict in the height of uh, COVID. Um, they've introduced a, an easier category, which is like if you're traveling outside of Australia for more than three months, that you can get an exemption now, but you have to sign a stack, uh, statutory declaration to say that you're going to be out of the country for um, uh, more than three months. So it's like- well, it's interesting because um, here in New Zealand, during this entire border closure, um, that there has never been a restriction on leaving the country. The restriction is on coming back into the country. So I guess that really makes sense. It's, it's somewhat of a loophole that now anyone in Australia who wants to leave, they, they don't need to apply for an exemption. All they've got to do is fly via New Zealand. Um, but I suppose it would depend on which, um, which passport they're traveling with and whether they would need a, an electronic travel authority, whether they're from a visa waiver country, whether, whether, in other words, whether they can actually come into New Zealand. But that's quite interesting. I actually, um, I thought that there would be quite a few people maybe taking advantage of that, um, and maybe there are. Yeah, I think the issue is, is that uh, a lot of people are wanting to travel out, but then they have to think about uh, uh, returning back to Australia um, and uh, um, probably similar to New Zealand that uh, there are sort of limited flights coming back to Australia. We have a cap on how many um, returning uh, passengers can enter the country each right. week. 
um, and each different port is different uh, depending on uh, like uh, usually Sydney and Melbourne are the bigger airports so they're the ones taking the brunt of all the um, returning passengers or like I think in Queensland they've got a maximum of 500 people per week that can enter oh, okay. the country so I think that while people are thinking about leaving that uh, it's practically it's probably not possible because of uh, returning back to Australia sure. as so unless they're leaving for good like this guy was in the news okay there's um something that uh, that I mentioned in a, a video that I did last week um, when we talked about the bubble and and that is this idea of a visa sort of laundry or um, you know the, the the idea of a visa run and mm. and as you probably know that many countries uh, when it comes to visas and immigration they, they sort of you know they have the rules of how long you can stay and then when you reach the end of that you need to leave the country and you need to apply from outside before you can come in again, or you need to at least travel before you can get that next visa. Um, New Zealand's not quite like that. We have, you know, it's, it's not really a country where you can take advantage of a visa run per se, but we had a bit of a chat on the phone um, last week about this, and you, you sort of mentioned that maybe, maybe there's some situation where this would work for people in Australia to, to take advantage of the bubble to come into New Zealand so they can therefore get back to Australia. Yes, that, 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 yeah, that's correct. So um, in Australia, that uh, we have this uh, thing in the Migration Act called uh, Section 48, and so uh, uh, for people who've uh, uh, got a visa here in Australia would know about Section 48 barred, meaning that they cannot, once their visa is refused, that they cannot apply for another visa in Australia um, right. after the visa of refusal. So that uh, um, a lot in the past, prior to COVID, they would uh, go somewhere like New Zealand or a closer country and then return back uh, on a fresh visa like a um, travel ETA visa and then they would uh, use that visa to apply for another visa. Yeah. Or um, what they would do is that uh, say that they were applying for a substandard visa like uh, um, a uh, skilled migration or work visa they would go offshore and then they would apply for that visa offshore and then return back on their bridging visa and then they would uh, wait for the outcome of their visa because the visa can be processed but uh, as long as the application is made offshore but they cannot make another application in the country okay and practically speaking do you think that this makes sense because as you say this, I'm, I'm imagining um, the situation actually is a little bit similar here. We have, um, for example, if you have applied for a temporary visa and meanwhile your previous visa expired, well, um, you're allowed to stay in the country on what we call an interim visa. So it's kind of like a bridging visa, but it's an interim visa. Now the interim visa will expire either after six months or it will expire within 21 days of the decline decision. So. Mm -hmm. So if your application was for, let's say, a work visa and it was declined mm. um, while you're holding an interim visa, you effectively have 21 days to leave the country. And, and much like your Section 48, on that interim visa, you cannot apply for another visa. Um, so this is where some people try, you know, um, unlawful requests or, or reconsiderations and things like that. But it's very risky and dangerous. And they, they may take advantage of this idea to go to Australia and then think of coming back, as you say, on an ETA or this and that. The problem that I see, and this is why I say that New Zealand is a little bit different, is because the New Zealand um, border officials and the immigration at the border, um, but you know, being a small country and being that there are few people coming in, uh, they watch out for that type of thing. And they, they very often would interview you at the border and say, hey, look, your last visa was declined. Why are you coming back in so quickly? Why did you go to Australia for three days? Um, and so they look at the principle of your travel. Whereas I'm, I'm imagining maybe Australia um, being a larger country and being multiple states, that it could be possible someone gets declined in Victoria, leaves the country, comes to New Zealand, stays for a week, and then goes and flies back to, let's say, Queensland. And then they may not necessarily think to even check or ask why that person's coming back in. Is that the case? Um, I guess that uh, it all depends on the situation. Um, like, it, they don't really look at it uh, uh, 
in regards to which uh, uh, where which port that you're re-entering in. So it's not like that they're gonna ask, say, oh, um, why did you go to New Zealand and then you come back uh, um, uh, like like three days later. But usually where the um, the problems lie is that um, unless you got a visa to uh, to the country that you're going to or a return ticket, uh, they won't even let you board the plane. So that that's uh, kind of like immigration um, sort of don't step in um, and um, it's more that the uh, airlines probably won't let yeah, you board yeah. the plane. Yeah, It'll stop you getting on the plane. Even here in, in New Zealand, we see that quite a lot actually. Um, people who are, are flying into Australia or trying to go to Australia um, to, to, to go back home, but they haven't sorted out their ETA for Australia or a transit visa and they'll get stopped even before they get on the plane. Um, so we do see that a fair bit. Um, yeah, no, I do wonder about that because then we have to think, well, practically speaking then, is there some type of trick or way to use this bubble um, other than um, the, the one which is quite obvious and that is where you, you, you've exhausted your options in one country and now you're gonna try the other one. I think this is probably what we're gonna see and, and we're already getting inquiries about this. We're having a, a number of our, uh, we could say our market here in New Zealand that are, are struggling and tired and they've spent the last year feeling very frustrated about not being able to get anywhere with their residence chances. And they're mm -hmm. starting to ask us, well, can we go to Canada? Um, or can we go to Australia? Can you guys help us go to Australia? And we're having to look at, well, is Australia gonna be any better for them? You know, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm assuming there would be something similar happening in Australia that some, you know, you mentioned you deal with Koreans. Um, there must be a, a, a large number of Koreans struggling to get their PR in Australia who might now be thinking, well, shall I move to New Zealand now because it's open? Yeah, funny that you mentioned that. I had a client uh, um, the other day that uh, came to me that uh, sort of went through all their options in Australia and that uh, uh, they're a nurse back home. Um, here in Australia, it's kind of difficult uh, now because of what's happening with uh, uh, COVID uh, to sort of do the sort of courses and bridging courses and uh, that uh, they uh, are looking at other options and one of those options that they looked at was uh, going and doing, uh, going to New Zealand and getting a student visa and going through that pathway because that pathway was looking to be like an easier option. Than sure, yeah, no, I would, I would say um, even with my, um, you know, limited knowledge of the Australian side, we do know as much that um, it's a bit easier here in New Zealand for a nurse. Um, uh, if that person is able to, uh, I think it's called a CAP course and they, they've got a good enough English score get registered here in New Zealand, there's, there's, there's gonna be a job waiting for them. And not only that, but if you're a nurse and you apply for residency under the skilled migrant category, your application will be prioritized. Mm. So whereas, whereas the average processing time currently is two to three years, um, mm. a nurse might be looking at three to four months. Yeah. Because it's, it's a priority case. Yeah, that, that's the same here in Australia that uh, we, um, at the moment, our borders are pretty shut, but we actually have a list of priority occupations that uh, uh, we're sort of allowing um, exemptions for allowing them to come in. And right. a lot of those are uh, in the health uh, sector and those are for nurses. But the problem is, it's a little bit of a red herring because that, uh, yes, you could be a nurse in your own country, but uh, unless you are registered in Australia and you meet that sort of uh, those standards that you won't be able to work in Australia. So it's kind yeah. of that point. Are there any other um, surrounding categories? So like I know we've sort of gone off on the tangent about nurses, but this is a big category for a lot of people. So here in New Zealand, what we see is people who are foreign qualified nurses from Korea, Philippines, um, India, usually, but other countries as well. Um, they'll come into New Zealand, find it difficult to become registered as a nurse here, and so they get into, let's say, aged care or um, disability care, that type of thing. And there are plenty of jobs in that field, depending on where you go here. And the pay rates are, are good enough for residents. Generally speaking, um, the jobs are good enough for applying for residents. And you don't need to be registered for it. Is there anything like that in Australia? 
Yeah, there's, we're nearly exactly the same here. That uh, um, there's a lot of uh, um, like barriers into becoming a, um, a registered nurse or even an enrolled nurse. And so a lot of those people that were registered nurse or uh, back in their home country will come to Australia and uh, uh, due to English language, due to sort of uh, the hurdles that they had to face, will get into jobs in aged care and disability and these sort of things. And um, unfortunately, like in Australia, you still have to have like at least a certificate three to start working in those industries. But that's where a lot of people start, uh, like they do uh, the certificate, a short certificate three or certificate four course in um, aged care or disability or individual support. And then they start working in the industry because there's so much demand for it. But the problem is, is that uh, at the moment, uh, those uh, uh, occupations are seen as like low skilled sort of labor and that there's not really a pathway to permanent residency and that's why like it's sort of a means to an end that where they can sort of work and get money and uh, uh, do something related to what they're qualified to but it's not going to get them to like the final destination of permanent well, residency. This is, this is probably where Australia and New Zealand have something in common. Uh, well we have a lot in common let's be honest. <laughs> um, but if, if you really look at it both countries try to attract highly skilled, skilled labour right and this means people with um, high levels of qualification coming in on high levels of pay and um, lots of work experience. But if you really think about it, um, probably what our countries really need is a lot more of the low skilled workers, actually, because we need to we need to support an aging population for one. Mm. Um, and we need to we need to fill in jobs that our youth don't necessarily want to do or are not interested in doing or and, and you know, in the old days, um, young people sort of wouldn't have a choice. They needed a job, they would take a job. But now if you look at what, what our governments are doing, which is printing money and handing it out for free, um, you know, the youth of today are, are naturally thinking them to themselves, well, why would I go and take one of these, um, you know, dirty, dangerous, um, and, or low paid jobs when I can, you know, go, go to university and get paid by the government or even don't go to university, just stay on your bum at home playing video games and getting paid by the government. So there's a, quite a generational shift that's happened. And this is, this is why we need migrants, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. And I think it, like in a, in Australia that uh, a lot a lot of it has been focused to that sort of uh, high skilled labor um like so you like your uh, doctors your nurses your yeah. engineers and things like that but uh they haven't sort of looked at sort of um you know the your uh, mechanics your carpenters yeah. your people that are working in social services that uh, you know that we really need um for here in Australia I think it's more about the um the government's like sort of put so much focus in the education system towards you your pathway is that you go to ter you go to tertiary education go to university and that you get a like high skilled job where they've neglected the sort of you know uh the uh, technical skills uh, that uh, you know where we have a shortage in and that's that's a good for our industry because that uh, uh, my job is to help people who have those skills migrate to australia Mm -hmm. Or if they can't come here, they, uh, send them your way to New Zealand. Sure, send them over. Um, we we'll give it a shot. And I mean, that sort of takes us into the other topic I wanted to cover today, which is uh, what's the future of migration in, in, in our countries? And, you know, I mean, there's plenty that I could say about New Zealand, but, um, but maybe you just let me know what, what do you think is, is going to happen? Where, where, where are things heading? How do you see changes coming forward in the future? Um, what does your government um, see? in a post COVID world, um, you know, what, what should migrants be thinking of if they're looking at either of our countries for their longer term? What, what do you think? What's your take on that? Well, um, I think that uh, both of our countries are lucky that uh, we've handled the COVID situation quite well. I think that, uh, as you said at the start of uh, this, uh, um, that, uh, you know, we're the envy of other uh, countries in the world. So that's something that we can be proud of and that, uh, you know, our economies will rely on, um, you know, my uh, migration in the future. I think that, uh, you know, even though at the moment that uh, the 
there's a lot of restrictions that will still be looking at migration. I think personally that they're gonna have to look at uh, uh, the uh, migration, uh, taking it away from really high skills to like these lower skill like sort of uh, occupations of uh, offering that uh, those sort of pathways. I think um, uh, prior to COVID that uh, they were sort of lowering the number of migrants coming to Australia um, um, or giving PR, but now they're uh, maybe looking at uh, keeping those people who are already in the country. Um, so those people who are in Australia at the moment uh, will probably uh, reap the benefits of uh, uh, if they hold tight and stay here. Um, so I know I have a lot of clients that, you know, because of COVID, uh, during the COVID times of lockdown that uh, a lot of people left. But uh, the ones that are staying, I think those are the ones that are going to sort of reap the benefits. Right. And I think that there's going to be probably more of a focus towards those lower skilled sort of, uh, um, rather, and rather than those high skill. But at the same time, that probably our... Australian government are looking for like uh, people with really uh, high talent. So we sort of introduced this uh, program called the Global Talent Visa, which uh, is like uh, promoting people who are sort of in those really like STEM industry uh, uh, sort of uh, related uh, uh, jobs to yeah. come to Australia uh, and bring those skills. So if you're an entrepreneur that has like a, a like a like a fintech company or something like that, or like biotech or robotics or things like that, they're really encouraging those people to bring those skills. Is, is that working out? Are them. people taking advantage of that program? Um, they've they launched it a lot at the middle of last year, but they've really started to push it more and more yeah. um, from this year. Um, with like there's like sort of trying to say that this is, uh, you know the future of like a uh, migration um, for the economy, trying to bring those people with those skills to Australia and, and they're sort of fast tracking those people for uh, to come to Australia. Also those uh, visas are sort of permanent residency visas. Uh, so that's sort of a encouraging. I just ask because they, they introduced a similar program here. They call it the global impact visa. Um, and possibly this was done in alignment with Australia or around the same time a year or two ago. And, and I, I believe it's been a flop. Um, oh, when I say it's been a flop, what I mean is it's, it hasn't had or it hasn't attracted a large amount of global talent. And this is even before COVID um, when, they, when they introduced it. Um, and, and I think what it, the reason for that is that it fails to take into account that the types of entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial mm. type uh, people they wanted to attract with it are not necessarily looking at New Zealand. Mm. Right? So they're in, maybe they're in Silicon Valley or they want to live in Europe or they want to travel uh, they want to be in bustling places. And New Zealand is, is a very small economy by, by all means. Um, mm. And so it's, it wasn't really that attractive for people. And I think it's been a very small uptake. Um, what was quite successful was a previous program we had here for a long-term business um, visa, which was a, a kind of a pathway to residence for people who came here and ran a business. And it didn't mm. have to be any kind of a fancy, um, you know, entrepreneurial business like the new, the, the system we have now is a little bit more, focused on that export um, potential, high growth businesses, um, innovating, innovation. Um, whereas the past system was really like, hey, you could have a little corner store, um, a grocery store. And, and I think that that really helped to boost the economy here in New Zealand because small businesses do boost an economy. Mm. This is where they've kind of lost, uh, lost track. I think probably both of our countries, but specifically mm. I can talk about New Zealand. If we talk about future prospects, um, that they've lost track of, of that fact that small businesses often run by migrants actually provide a lot of economic growth because there's, there's money coming through, there's tax, there are jobs. Um, although um, we are definitely seeing our government talking about that they, they want to attract people who want to invest in New Zealand and who want to run business in New Zealand. So, so there's talk about that. And I think that's kind of, that's the track that we're seeing this government go down. Um, it's, it's, it's not going to be as much about the migrant themselves. It's going to be more about the employment factors in New Zealand. And if there, are, if there are people wanting to migrate to New Zealand, specifically choosing New Zealand, what we're telling them is, okay, look, let's make an assessment of what your financial position is, uh, what your long-term plans are, um, and, and whether you're a suitable person to, to bring your family here in the long term 
because skilled migrant category is, is now on hold basically for the last 12 months. They're still catching up on a backlog. So we've got people waiting two years just to have their case assigned to a visa officer. Um, and I think, I think it's leading people to, to believe that, that it's dying, the entire category, the entire um, system is, is somewhat dying. So we're, we're, we're talking about maybe a bit of a, a fundamental change in the way we think about immigration to New Zealand. So it's not really about the migrant and individuals who are skilled, but perhaps the future is really focusing on employers, employment, companies in New Zealand, sustainable business practices, and then focusing on what that business needs as opposed to just the individual migrant. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I mean, uh, <laughs> the future is, is anybody's guess, I suppose. You know, I agree with a lot of the uh, sentiments that you have because same here in Australia that uh, um, they, uh, with their business visas, that uh, in reality, it's not really um, supporting those uh, small businesses uh, there's, uh, because like of the threshold that you need to have to uh, uh, um, invest in Australia. Uh, if uh, there are some programs that uh, like it's a state by state basis, like some uh, states have like Queensland, I think uh, uh, Tasmania as well, that they have like a, what they call a uh, small business owner category, where if you had $100,000 and you bought a existing business that you could uh, um, use that as a uh, pathway for permanent residency. But the issue here is, is uh, it always goes back to skilled migration. So it's not a uh, specific, I'm going to buy this business, I'm going to invest and um, I'm going to start my sort of like restaurant or um, uh, mum and pop store. It's actually like you have to be a skilled migrant. Uh, like for example, if you were going to buy a restaurant, you had to be a, like a a chef and you have to pass the skills assessment and have um, uh, English uh, um, IELTS 6 uh, in each band and all these things uh, before you can actually uh, fit that criteria, which it shouldn't be the case. It should be that, uh, you know, if you are willing to sort of uh, bring uh, these sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, value uh, through your small business, it shouldn't be about uh, do you have a skills assessment <laughs> or do you have IELTS 6? Because uh, how is uh, I'll, you know the, how how can you use that as a reflection whether that you're going to um, contribute to the to the economy or contribute to the society? Yeah, fair enough. Mm, okay, so the last thing I was wondering about before we finish up was uh, let's say we've got somebody who's in New Zealand holding a, a temporary visa, or perhaps even someone who is a resident here but who who comes from a country that does require to, you know, is required to apply for a visa for, for Australia before going there. Um, would you think that it's going to be difficult or easy for those people to apply for a short term holiday to travel to Australia? Let's, let's, let's choose some of the, the, the maybe the more difficult countries who, who normally have difficulty in applying for these visas, like people who are coming from the Indian subcontinent, um, you know, or, or perhaps even from, from China, where they do need to apply for that visa. Um, how strictly is the Australian government, do you think, looking at the purpose of travel? Um, do you think it's going to be hard or easy for them to apply for a visitor visa to take advantage of the bubble? I, it, it all depends. It's all case by case uh, basis. Uh, I think that those people that uh, are residing in New Zealand and like, uh, if they are working or um, maybe that they're permanent residents but they have like uh, still foreign passports then uh, that's going to be a lot uh, more easier than someone maybe that is just say uh, a student or something like that uh, that uh, just wants to come over for a visit. I, I think that uh, whenever I have applicants wanting to apply for a, a visitor visa from those high-risk countries that always like try to um, show in their case that they have a reason to return back to their own country. So employment's a big one, like other commitments are uh, ways that we can sort of uh, um, help the application get across the line. Okay, and let's let's say that one of these people applied for a visitor visa, and they said in the application form that um, they look they've just been cooped up here in New Zealand during COVID, and they need a holiday, and they want to go and visit some friends or travel around, let's say Melbourne, and have a look at the um, the sites. And while they're there, 
they change their mind and they decide to apply for something else, student visa, work visa. How strictly does the Australian government then uh, look into that application and, and check what, you know, what we refer to as the bona fides, the, the genuine intentions for that first application? What, how, how do you see them dealing with that type of thing? Uh, like, I mean, it all, it's all case by case basis. So uh, that uh, in Australia, that if you come to Australia, uh, but your initial intention was uh, to be a tourist and to go back and you've sort of got all the plans out like an itinerary and like return ticket, uh, then um, that in Australia, we can um, give you the leeway to change your mind. Um, and uh, you can uh, put this in your application for like a student visa, work visa, what, uh, uh, whatever uh, uh, temporary visa or another visa that you applied for in Australia. Um, where the sort of, uh, there would be issues is that uh, I always sort of say to people, if you're thinking about coming to Australia and applying for another visa, sort of, uh, you know, uh, don't uh, only put uh, tourists. Don't hide it. Yeah, yeah. Don't hide it. Yeah, but don't like. Uh, for example, that I had some people that are thinking about applying for um, a student visa. So um, on their visitor uh, on their uh, um, card for entering um, Australia, that you know, uh, put down education as well. Like uh, um, that, uh, you know, you could change your mind. They um, right. Yeah, don't. Yeah. Don't hide your intentions. That's that's a big one. Um, I, I'd, say, I'd say it's probably the same as what we see here. That if the government finds out that, you know, you 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 said that you're coming for a visit and that's it because you've got a job back home, but then they find out that actually you quit your job before you got on the plane, um, they can come back and raise concerns about that. We see the same thing all the time. So I guess for the for the listener out there, the 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 really the best advice is if you're thinking about travelling, <laughs> come and talk to a professional first. Because, as you say, Ed, it's on a case by case basis, and you know they're, they're, they're going to consider the entire circumstances. So that's really our job, isn't it, to help them um, understand the entire circumstance and prepare a plan that's going to um, that's going to work in their in their circumstances. Yeah, the, that's right. I mean, and uh, uh, there's always stories. I've had cases where, like, the the visa was refused because on their um, uh, incoming card that they uh, put down that they're only going to be here for a holiday, but they ended up applying for a, uh, a student visa. So, uh, yeah. you know, uh, if you come and see a, a professional like ourselves, that uh, you and you're upfront about these sort of things, then we can uh, make plans to mitigate that. Uh, to approve for the visa application. Cool. Well, on that note, I guess we'll just remind everyone who's watching that um, if you need some help, if you want some advice, um, both Eddie and myself are usually available for a somewhat of a free consultation initially to look at your circumstances. And if you need to take things further, we can always talk about that. We're going to put the details for Eddie below um, and for us. <laughs> and uh, yeah, once again, really nice to catch up, Eddie. We'll, we'll do this again soon. Yeah, um, no, thank you for inviting me. Um, just, uh, uh, I watched your video that you initially did and I just want to sort of also reiterate that this uh, travel bubble always uh, go with caution because things do happen rapidly and so um, it's uh, best to make sure that if you are thinking about using this travel bubble that you are um, taking the most uh, care with it because um, I forgot to say earlier today that uh, um, I think WA had a case, uh, in Western Australia had a case and uh, their travel bubble was suspended. So, you know, it can happen anytime that uh, yeah. their case could pop up, the travel bubble could be suspended. And that is not good if you're uh, using that uh, bubble for some of the things that we said before. So Exactly. In other, words, in other words, exercise extreme caution because you could just find yourself on the wrong end of a closed the door yeah that's correct <laughs> that's basically it okay all right thanks everybody